Um, <laughs> so great. Um, well, uh, we really appreciate this. Um, uh, I, I, I want to start with this. Uh, you, you were, you came to the surface transportation board from Metra. You were, you were on the, the board of that. You ran Metra prior to, uh, uh, STB were at that time when you got to, uh, the, the board, were you aware of the issues in, in freight rail? I mean, was any, did anything surprise you about, uh, you came from a commuter rail, uh, service, uh, into freight rail. Uh, what, what was, what was surprising about that when you got there in 2019? I should, uh, add uh, one thing, David, uh, to your lead in. And that is I came to Metra having had no background in railroads whatsoever. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, and uh, so I had a, you know, a total quick immersion uh, because they made me chairman almost as soon as I got there. Uh, <laughs> we, of course, interacted with freight rail, rail a lot, but sure. uh, didn't have anywhere near the familiarity of, of with the issues that now confront the board. Uh, and the answer is no. I, I really came to the STB for better or worse is largely a blank slate in terms of the state of freight rail. And uh, I, I have uh, thought that that turned out to be a great advantage. I had no preconceived notions. Uh, and I began almost as, as soon as you become a member of the board, long before I became chairman, uh, people in the rail world are very happy to seek you out and tell you what they think. Um, and uh, that includes uh, shippers, that includes uh, short line railroads, former rail executives, current rail executives, and, and certainly labor, uh, and, and many other kinds of stakeholders. And a, except from the self-interest of great railroads, a pretty consistent picture started to emerge in 2019 and has only, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, been exacerbated since then. Of a, of a real systemic deterioration in uh, the quality and quantity of freight rail service in this country, which I have reluctantly concluded over, particularly over the recent year, uh, is a, a huge damper on our national economy. Uh, but I didn't, uh, I didn't expect it. I can't say I was surprised because I didn't know what to expect, uh, but I've certainly been uh, disappointed in the, uh, because of the potential of the freight rail network to build our economy is so great and we're not living up to it. Yeah. Um, and of course you come in and there is one of the most disruptive, disruptive events in, in the history of our, our supply chains, which is the pandemic. Um, you know, many, many people have attributed sort of the current performance issues and in freight rail to that and the changes in goods demand and uh, the, the issues with workers. And others say that, you know, this is a legacy issue that long predates COVID and goes back really to the core of the business model. Uh, uh, where, where do you fall uh, on that? I think it's almost without debate that <laughs> it has very little to the, the real problems in the freight rail network have almost nothing to do with the pandemic. Uh, to, to quote uh, one of my early political mentors, Harold Washington, that, that's a canard, uh, <laughs> uh, a word he loved to throw around. The, uh, uh, if you look at the history of freight rail in the last six, eight, 10 years, uh, freight rail began to disarm itself and reduce its resources uh, long before the pandemic began. <clears throat> By the time the pandemic hit, the seven class one railroads had reduced their workforce by close to 30%. Uh, about 45,000 people. You cannot run a robust freight rail network with that much of a reduction. Some reduction, maybe. I don't have a magic number. I just know that what they did has been way too much. The pandemic uh, led, led the railroads to then reduce the workforce by even more. And that only <laughs> has exacerbated the situation. And anybody who knows anything about freight rail and the people who run the railroads certainly ought to know it. Uh, would know that you can't just dump that many workers and then expect to recall them all immediately when you need them. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Yes, in the past years, more furloughed workers came back. That was a positive experience. Uh, but everyone knew the pandemic was something new and unique. And before rushing into dumping more workers, you ought to think, think about it. And I've said so much to the 
uh, railroad CEOs, all of whom I meet with from time to time. Right. Rail companies have cut their workforces by, I think, nearly 30 percent uh, since 2016. And one CEO called for as little as one worker per train. Uh, so well, all, it, of, all of them would like to have one worker per train. <laughs> well, it, is, is it fair to sum it up as, you know, we've seen the industry give up resiliency for the sake of efficiency? And what's been the cost of that on efficiency for that matter? Well, the claim is for sake of efficiency. The reason is for sake of profit. Uh, the profits have go been going through the roof. Uh, it's enabled the railroads to spend billions and billions of dollars on stock buybacks and uh, dividends. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that, but there is a dog outside my window. I can. <laughs> yeah. What kind of dog do you have? I have, don't have a dog, and I'm on the third floor of my house. Oh, so we're very, wow. It's a, lot of it's a very uh, robust lunged dog. Yeah, then. yeah I thought you. So uh, they claim it's for efficiency, uh, but if you talk to the people who need rail service, they would tell you in many instances it's not very efficient. Great service has deteriorated. It got so bad. This year, we had emergency hearings in April to explore what happened, and we issued directives to the for large US railroads to come up with an improvement plan to try to restore service. So uh, it's, I don't think the cutting has ultimately been in the interest of serving efficiency. So, so we hear this, this uh, phrase, you, you mentioned sort of uh, the, the, you know, the desire for profits. We hear this phrase precision scheduled railroading uh, floated around often by investors in in these uh, these companies. Um, to to what extent is that driving the conversation, uh, uh, driving the situation that we that we face here? Uh, this desire for to please really the investor class. Well, there are two two things. First of all, and I'll deal with that point directly, but I usually. I rarely condemn PSR uh, by name for a few reasons. One is I don't know what it is. It's different at every railroad. And every time you ask somebody to explain it, you get a different explanation. Hmm. Um, th there's some, some elements of efficiency that seem to go along with what a number of the railroads have done in their so-called implementation. But it has really been an excuse, a vehicle for cutting workers. Uh, much more so than for achieving efficiencies. It looks efficient on paper in some cases, but when you really get down to it, it, it has not improved service for many sectors of the economy. For some, it has. Uh, clearly, the Wall Street uh, investment firms, the hedge funds and other large investors that have taken major positions with the class one railroads are, are driving this, but nobody should assume that it's some kind of an outside force. The chief executives and their teams are, are all stockholders. So they're all in this together. And uh, the cutting of the workers has driven up stock prices tremendously uh, and allowed for these uh, buybacks and dividends. So they're all getting rich from this. That's what's driving it. I don't think it's much of a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. By the way, I think we'd all probably do the same if we were sitting in their chairs, you had a chance to get rich legally, you'd probably do it. I would probably do it, but that doesn't mean it's good for the public or good public policy or consistent with our statutes. Sure, I mean, supply and demand dictates you cut capacity and 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 you end up getting to pay more for your, for your service. 100%. So at the time of the Staggers Act in 1980, there were 40 class one railroads. Um, and today there are seven and a pending merger would take us to six. Uh, in the US, there are by and large two railroads serving the East Coast and two serving the West Coast. Would you say there's a concentration problem in freight rail and is that driving the capacity of reductions? Well, there certainly is a concentration problem. And I don't know if it's driving it, but it permits it because there are many, many places in the country where as a practical matter, uh, rail customers do not have a choice. They are limited to one railroad. And so as bad as service may get or as high as prices may rise, the, the customers don't have an option. So they stick with the railroad. I mean, large shippers of grain, chemicals, 
oil, uh, other large industrial products really cannot move those products by truck. Some people can move by truck, but we don't want that. We don't want, uh, it, it takes four semis to equal one rail car. So uh, all the traffic that's not moving on rails is worsening our environment and burning more fuel uh, relating to the oil shortage and diesel prices. And it's uh, greatly de uh, increasing deterioration of the highways. So uh, the fact that there are basically, as you accurately described it, uh, two railroads on each end side of the country. And by the way, they overlap in some places, but in many places, they really sort of divide the country up into quarters. Mm. And uh, they're happy to be monopolistic operators inside those geographies. So it's, I think the pendulum has swung too far. I think that in 1980, uh, there was a great need to rationalize the rail system. It was overbuilt, it wasn't efficient, it was over, vastly overregulated by the ICC. Uh, so a lot of the reforms and from the Staggers Act to consolidate and rationalize the system were good and were needed, but I think the pendulum has swung too far. <coughs> Got it. Which is why we still exist, I guess. <laughs> uh, well, um, the, the Biden administration has looked at this swinging of the pendulum too far in yours and many other industries. Uh, there was this executive order about promoting competition across the U.S. economy. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a whole of government approach. And I'm wondering how you're looking at that and thinking about implementing that. Uh, I mean, I know you have this, this potential uh, uh, rule, this reciprocal switching rule that they could be seen in that context to promote competition. Uh, how, are, how are you uh, implementing this, this executive order? Well, let, let me say a couple of things. Before Biden even became president, I and other board members were very much concerned about competition. Mm -hmm. And I was delighted when the president announced this whole government effort in the area because it was totally consistent with the approach I thought we needed to take in the rail industry. We have to keep in mind, your listeners should keep in mind that we are an independent agency, and which means there's nothing wrong with us coordinating or being consistent with the presidential policy statements. But uh, unlike a cabinet department, you know, the president can't order us to do things. But uh, it's been a very collaborative effort. Uh, and I have uh, worked closely with people in the White House and I'm, I'm happy that we're all on the same page. There, unlike other industries, however, there are limits on how much competition we can foment because of the physical situation that Lee just observed. Nobody's gonna build another railroad across the country. It's just never gonna happen. So we're stuck with the infrastructure we have now. Right. And I do think there can be and should be more competition between railroads. I don't think they want to compete to a large extent. In some places they do, but I think they're very complacent with the situation as it is. The rulemaking you referred to is actually some version of it has been pending for six years. Uh, it's generally referred to as reciprocal switching. The idea behind the rule is where uh, a rail customer, a shipper, is served by one railroad, but one of the other railroads is within striking distance, and the, the serving railroad could deliver that person's freight to the competing railroad for a fee, then the shipper would have a choice. But there could be competition between the two railroads. It's quite controversial. Uh, we are, we had hearings on this subject in the spring. Uh, it's a high priority of mine to try to move forward with the concept. The details and exactly how we should do it are being carefully studied at the board and a lot of debate and discussion going on among the board members as to how to proceed. I think we will proceed in some fashion in the very foreseeable future, but it is it's extraordinarily complicated to do it right, in my view. And it will, I think if we can figure out the right way to, to enact a rule that will allow competition, 
I think that we'll, will improve the situation for some shippers, but it'll be a limited number of shippers. You can't, that rule will not bring competition to the entire country, it's just not physically possible. Right, right. Um, and of course, you know, the idea that we're going to uh, get back to some sort of uh, pre-staggers environment would not be uh, realistic or maybe even desirable, as you mentioned. But there is this pending merger, as 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 Lee has noted, between Kansas City Southern and, and Canadian Pacific. You probably don't want to talk about the, the specifics of that, given the pending uh, uh, decision that needs to be made. Um, one, one thing I would ask generally is about uh, the way in which um, commuter rail and freight rail intersect. And, and it's particularly been talked about a lot with respect to this merger, including by Metra, uh, the, the, the ways in which uh, uh, you know, they use the same rail lines. Uh, there's there's uh, you know, potential uh, uh, delays and disruption issues when you have very large freight rail lines. Uh, especially with something like uh, this, that would, you know, a large part of what Canadian Pacific and uh, as a merged ent entity might want to do is move tar sands oil or, or things from Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that that could create real problems from a commuter rail standpoint. So how do you balance in thinking about this, uh, where commuter rail? Uh, uh, and 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 freight rail should you know what should take precedence there? Well, those are complicated questions. I'd love to talk about the merger, but of course I can't. Right. Uh, so I'll try to talk uh, because it's pending, obviously, and I'm going to have to vote on it one way or the other. Uh, we certainly have had a great deal of input from Metro uh, and other uh, concerned citizens in the Chicago area. Uh, about the impacts of the merger and all of that is being really is being studied and it's being uh, analyzed and it, we will obviously deal with those issues one way or the other when we decide on whether the merger should be approved and if so with with or without conditions which we can impose I can't go beyond that what I what I would say David is that uh, well, a couple of things about commuter rail and this is a nuance which very few of us citizens would have any understanding of, but we weren't in the middle of the rail industry. There was a difference between commuter rail and Amtrak. There are statutes which created Amtrak, which give the STB the, not only the power, but the duty to make sure that Amtrak trains get preference on freight routes. It's a constant struggle uh, to, to do that. Uh, but there's a statutory uh, authority for us to regulate in that area. There is no comparable statutory power with regard to commuter rail. Mm -hmm. So if uh, commuter rail is running on freight lines, which it does in most places, many places, and there's interference by freight, we don't currently have the authority to regulate that. Uh, mm -hmm. Potential mm -hmm. interference is something we can take into account when, when we're considering a merger. That's right. a little different. The law here is somewhat complicated. The only thing I would say, it's having been chairman of Metro for three years, is that there is no more complex freight rail and passenger rail terminal in the world than Chicago. <laughs> uh, the Chicago terminal has roughly 1,500 trains which go through it every day. <laughs> Seven, uh, before the pandemic anyway, and I think we'll get back there, about 750 of them are metro trains, 500 or so freight trains, some of which are a couple of miles long, and about 100 Amtrak trains. And they all use the same terminal, many, many miles of track and intersections. And um, I am proud to say when I was at Metro, and I don't think I had much to do with it, I think it was our operating people, Metro had uh, the best on-time performance record of any commuter railroad in the country of over 95%. Uh, a couple of lines had some a little bit less, but nobody went below 90. That is a pretty impressive record in such a complex system. So I think it is entirely possible for freight rail and commuter rail to coexist. There has to be a constructive attitude, a lack of selfishness on the part of the freight railroads. 
Uh, it seemed to work quite well. I think it was as much cultural as anything else and I didn't create it. I was just there temporarily, uh, but it worked pretty well. And um, whatever the outcome of this merger is, I would expect that kind of cooperation to continue. Uh, but it, it's not like on some Amtrak routes where the on-time performance is not anywhere near 90% or even 80%. Uh, often because of freight rail interference, that just didn't happen in, with Metro. And I don't think it happens with commuter rail and other major metropolitan areas very much either. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference. I, I, yeah, great. Just Thanks. on Chicago, I wonder, have you ever read um, the historian Bill Cronin's book, Nature's Metropolis? It's, no. a, it's, it's a really fabulous history of uh, Chicago arising around uh, lumber, meat, and, and grain trade, uh, and, and um, the rail industry and that, and, and the origin of like financial futures markets in grain shipping <laughs> from, from Chicago. So I really recommend it. But, um, well, I will, let me say one thing about that. I, I, I observed when I was at Metro, and I actually made this observation again recently, uh, after learning and studying what the Chicago rail terminal looks like, if you actually looked at it from the air, uh, the conclusion was is that if you were really starting again from prairie, you would never design a rail system to look like it does today. But it sort of grew up helter-skelter for all the reasons you just enumerated, Lee. And nobody was uh, sort of overseeing the development. Railroads just put tracks down wherever they could to make the most money. And now we have this very jumbled system, but it works to some degree it doesn't always actually work for freight as much as it does for commuter. Um, and there is a project now going on in Chicago. It has been going on for 20 years. We just had a groundbreaking a couple of days ago of a part of it called CREATE, which is a consortium of the freight railroads, Metra, Amtrak, and the local governments and the federal government, all uh, putting in a substantial billions of dollars to build overpasses and bypasses and straighten out some of the spaghetti bowl that developed over the last 200 years. Hmm. And these projects are improving the fluidity of the rail system for all, for passenger and freight. Uh, so we're trying to remedy some of those problems of the past. But I think the book sounds fascinating, other than my staff who's with me here today, constantly dumping huge briefs on my desk for me to read. I'm sure I have time to <laughs> There you go. Um, well, I wonder, so you brought in a lot of shippers to talk about uh, the problems in, in freight rail that you've been discussing. And it's pretty striking to hear businesses that are not normally big champions of regulation in their own industries uh, saying something needs to be done about standards in freight rail. What's been your takeaway from those meetings? Well, it, it is an interesting point. Uh, yes, we sort of stand a, a, as a fulcrum, the board does, in many cases between very large businesses. You know, you have the railroads, which are gigantic corporations on one side, and you have shippers uh, like Dow Chemical, Archer Daniels Midland, Cargill, uh, large chemical companies on the other side. But they're all needed to make our economy function. Uh, about 40% of the country's economy in one way or the other functions only because of the freight rail system. Uh, and so it, there is an irony sometimes of listening to these large businesses uh, complain about each other. But, but the, uh, the difference is, is that these big shippers for the most part are not anywhere near the monopolistic, have the, anywhere near the monopolistic power that the railroads have. So even a, even a Dow chemical can be uh, a victim of uh, you know, predatory activity by, by the railroads because they often have no choice. Um, and I don't mean to sing aloud, Dow, it could be any, any one of a number of many, many shippers. The only reason I mentioned Dow is that sometimes when I have been talking to railroads about their monopolistic power, they bring up Dow. They say, Dow is bigger than we are. And I say, yes. <laughs> But you're the only railroad Dow has. So. <laughs> right. Um, there's also been, I mean, you referenced this before, uh, just sort of an unusual amount of bipartisan support 
uh, within the board for uh, you know the types of actions that you've been talking about. Uh, you, you know, it, it's particularly around election time. It's very rare to see uh, this, this this level of, of bipartisan interest in 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 along similar lines. Uh, why why do you think that the the board has acted with this level of unanimity? Is it just that the 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 issues are 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 that clear, or is it is it sort of the culture? Uh, uh, why do you think you have this this good sort of bipartisan working relationship? Well, I'm glad you raised it. I, I think the principal answer is that there are four other board members who are really good people. I mean, they're constructive. They're not ideologues. They have their own opinions. Some are uh, more conservative on some issues than others. But I think we're, as a group, very pragmatic. And I think everybody comes to work every day without some kind of a political agenda, but with a a goal of being practical in making sure the freight rail system works. Um, you know, I, I sometimes I tell my fellow board members, only two of them are lawyers, that uh, I use a phrase that every most, I think every first year law student hears, and that is the facts make the law. And the facts have really dictated to us what, what our actions need to be. Um, I will take a little bit of credit. I don't like to pat myself on the back because I really think it is a very much a collegial and group effort. But the, ch the chairman is in a position at the STB to set the agenda, decide when cases need to be voted on to direct staff and so forth, even though we all have equal, we all have the same vote. Um, and I just believe in, I always have throughout my career, both in public and private sector, in building consensus. And so I personally have worked very hard. I enjoy it very much. I'm not complaining of working with each board member to build consensus. And it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of respect for each other. And I think, unfortunately, in Washington, we don't always see that. We have people who are power hungry or selfish or whatever the reasons are. And uh, so I try to accommodate everybody's point of view when we're negotiating language in a decision or even what the outcome of a particular matter should be. Uh, I sometimes have uh, given up some positions that I've asserted in order to get a unanimous vote. And other, I know other board members have too. I think we've all come to value the idea of consensus. And I think it's two things, if I could take a, a moment to say, I think consensus particularly in the current atmosphere in politics is as a value in and of itself. I mean, after all, that's why we have politics for competing interests to come together and work things out. That's why the system exists. I also think it's very important in this industry where the railroads have traditionally, going back to 1887 when the ICC was created because of potential abuses of railroad power, uh, the railroads have always had a tremendous amount of political influence and power in Washington. And I think it is very important, given the problems with the industry, for us to act when we can in unison to say, look, this isn't, uh, we're not uh, doing these things for partisan reasons. We're doing them because the rail industry needs these actions we're taking uh, to be improved. It sends a much more powerful message to the industry to, to do what we want them to do when we issue these decisions. Uh, there won't always be unanimity, but I think it's a value working to, to work for. Uh, so I will, uh, mm -hmm. I will take some credit as the person who has patience and respect for my board members, but really the credit belongs to them. Great. Um, looming over all of this is the potential strike or lockout of workers who haven't reached an agreement on the latest contract terms. Um, I know the Labor Department has been taking the lead there, but is there any role your agency has played with that? And what's the impact of the labor strife on the on the kind of need for surge capacity? Uh, unfortunately, our role is mostly watching and worrying. Uh, <laughs> we don't have any jurisdiction over collective bargaining issues. Um, and I, I personally, and I think the other board members we, on a public level have tried to stay out of taking positions 
in the certainly in the specific positions in the ongoing negotiations, it would, even though I'm sure we all have our own views, uh, because we don't have jurisdiction and it's, you know, collective bargaining is delicate enough as it is. Having said that, uh, it's clear, you, we know this from all the testimony at our hearings back in April, that uh, the railroad labor force is very unhappy with what's happened to the industry with the elimination of all the positions as we talked about, onerous work rules. Uh, they were talking in April at our hearings about the quality of life issues that have come up in collective bargaining. So having a, uh, a, a robust workforce that likes to come to work every day is important for the success of these railroads and I would hope they would work it out. But we have no direct jurisdiction over how they work it out. And on a on a related note, the railroads say, you know, they've been hit by the same labor, shor labor shortages that we've seen across the economy. You've rejected that, why? <laughs> well, it was because it's self-inflicted. They were short 45,000 workers before the pandemic hit. Uh, and then they laid off thousands of additional workers. Now, interestingly enough, even in the rail industry, uh, most of the short line railroads, some of which are relatively large operations, did not lay off their workers. They took the position, which I think was responsible, to say, well, the freight rail is going to come back one day and we need to be ready. You can't just eliminate workers and then hope to, to recover. It takes a long time. Rail workers should are trained usually about six months. Uh, one of the things that's happened, and we had a report on this just uh, yesterday uh, from labor, the, uh, some of the railroads have cut the training down to eight weeks or so, which is just not enough training for a rail worker. It's a very highly skilled and potentially very dangerous kind of labor. Um, so uh, many industries, including other short line railroads, uh, many of the large shippers, we're talking about these companies, you know, that we hear from, large chemical companies, grain companies, didn't lay off anybody during the pandemic, and they retained their workforce. So yes, there is a shortage nationwide, but that shortage is much worse, I think, in the rail industry, because they were already way below the needed workforce when the pandemic began. Hmm. So, I mean, let's try to talk about some solutions here. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we obviously need a freight rail industry that supports commerce, supports business activity, helps with economic recovery, uh, and doesn't contribute to the sort of shortages and inflation problems that we're seeing throughout the economy. Do you think that this is going to be a decision that the railroads are going to have to come to, a cultural shift? that they're gonna to have to hire more and, and, and engage in, in the activity needed to support business? Or you know, do you think that, that the STB can, can really drive that entirely on its own to uh, you know, take the actions to ensure a better supply chain for everybody? Well, how do you see it? It uh, goes right to the heart of the matter, your, your question, David. About five years ago, uh, a retiring CEO, highly respected, of one of the class one railroads uh, on his uh, exit uh, warned the industry that if it kept going with uh, these relatively extreme uh, operating procedures of cutting and cutting and uh, you know raising their profits and, and so forth that we've been talking about, if they kept pushing that envelope, they would eventually bring the Congress and the SDB down on their heads. And uh, I think that trend is, is going in that direction. Now, what it is that the Congress or we might do, that's an open question. Uh, but it has caused all this activity that we've already engaged in at, at the board over the last year or so, These this uh, service recovery order that we issued back in, in May, that's, you know, that wasn't received with open arms by the railroads, they weren't happy about it. Um, and uh, the, certainly the reciprocal switching rulemaking, which I hope to, to get into action. There are a number of things that we 
are seriously looking at that they're not happy about. All of those things together will not totally solve the problem because I think the motivation is a very powerful force of, of profits and, and stock prices. And that's a pretty powerful force to come up against with human behavior. So I think that, uh, and it's something that occupies a great deal of my thinking as I go about these problems, is there a way to have a regulatory system which motivates the railroads in their own self-interest <laughs> to be providing more and better service and carrying more freight on the rails? And I, I think it's a complex question. I don't have an answer to it. But I think if the railroads don't improve on their own, there will be forces in Congress uh, and certainly forces in, among the shipping community and the labor community to be pushing for a change in how railroads are regulated. Do, and, do you think- And I have said many, many times, and I would say it today, it would be much, much better for the industry to come up with its own changes. They know the system better than I do or anybody else, but we can't just sit back and do nothing right. because it's too important to the economy. Is there any tool that you think Congress could give you that would be helpful in that regard? Uh, is there anything that you feel like, like Congress could be doing that, uh, that, that could improve the situation? There are a number of, of bills and legislative ideas that have been floating around and pending in Congress for a long time, uh, some of which I think could help. I have yet to figure out a silver bullet to say, well, if only you gave us this authority, we solved the problem. Right. And because it is so complicated, and quite frankly, because it involves a very sophisticated uh, intervention in the world of economics and business, which is not my personally my turf. I have a lot of experts in those areas at the board, fortunately. I have been reluctant to come out and say, here's what Congress should do. Mm -hmm. However, it's an area that I'm continuing to study. We have unused power. The one area that gets a lot of discussion uh, uh, is the common carrier doctrine, which is ensconced in the statutes. But the statute, and you know, some of your listeners may be familiar with or have heard about the common carrier doctrine. It started in medieval England, really. Uh, uh, but as our, our statute simply says that railroads must provide service on reasonable request. That's it. That's the whole law. Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been a, cases off and on over the decades that the ICC was there and now that we're there that have fleshed it out a little bit. But there is no overarching regulatory scheme to implement the common carrier doctrine. I think the board could do so by regulation, but adopting regulations uh, as it should be with all with an administrative agency is a slow moving complex process because we're, we're in effect making law and we're doing it at a very grant. Unlike Congress, which usually passes broad policy statements, we would be doing it at a very granular level right. and you have to make sure you don't, you know, the solution isn't worse than the problem. Uh, so it's something that I have not wanted to just rush into, but I think that is an area under existing statute and authority to make regulations. We could uh, perhaps set some better, more concrete standards for rail service, which might be one way of improving the situation, but we haven't done it yet. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, uh, Martin, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really a, a great education and, uh, and, uh, I hope our, our listeners, uh, take, take something from it the way that we did. Uh, so I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thank my, you. Mark. My pleasure. Delighted. You're very, uh, very pertinent questioners. And I, I, let me just say one thing that listeners okay. should absorb about the freight rail system, because I'm sure many of them are like me, you know, we know it's there. We don't pay much attention to it. But everything that affects our lives, the price of bread, the price of cars, uh, uh, is all determined ultimately to a large extent by transportation costs. Uh, and the success of our economy as a whole rests to a large extent on having a healthy freight rail network. So everybody has a stake in it. It's just complicated to figure out what, 
how to advocate for that state. Absolutely. So, thank That's you. why we're here. Thank you. Right. Martin uh, Oberman is the chair of the Surface Transportation Board. Uh, all right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.